want to talk about the Word of God tonight, and that is the title of the message tonight. It's called The Word of God, and uh, we're going to take the main message, and the main scriptures are going to be in Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. And while you are all making it to Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, I'm going to say a prayer. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, uh, to explain your word, to talk about your word, Lord, to, to um, help to lead us and guide us, Lord. I, I just ask that I say the proper words, Lord, so that um, people can grow and, uh, uh, spiritually and, and that it helps all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You get up there, that up. Sister Monica is doing such a good job. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Can you put 13 up there too and we'll just read all of that right now? Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. If you could go back to verse 12, please, now. I just want to say that I gave a message on these verses one time, and it's been, oh, I don't know, half a year, maybe a year ago, something like that. And I, and I kind of had fun with it because it was... Uh, we, we talked about a lot about the two-edged sword and the, and the Wells kids were here at the time and, and I got to mess around with Brandon with the, you know, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember that or not, but I want to go a little, I want to go a little deeper than not that and not really mess around with the sword so much tonight, if y'all don't mind. Um, that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and I think we all got a lot out of it, but I, I'd like to uh, kind of leave that part out tonight. So um, let's just break this down a little bit, because there's a, really a lot to be said about this right here. Um, we say, for the Word of God. What is the Word of God? Well, a lot of it is our Bible. That's what it is. That is the Word of God. Um, the Word of God is the revealed truth. Well, you might say, well, what is the revealed truth? Well, I can tell you what it's not. It's not a collection of ancient and dusty religious writings. That's not what it is. It's always current. God's Word is always current and up to date. It's always uh, life-changing. That's very good. It's always the constant mind of, of, of God. No matter when it was written, it pertains to us in any time of life. It pertained to uh, way back in Adam and Eve's time all the way until wherever the future of the earth ends. That's how much it pertains. It doesn't matter when it was written. It all pertains to everybody's life who has ever lived on earth. And you may say, well, Brother Scotty, why is that? If it was written, if Paul wrote a lot of it, how did any of that pertain to, to say, Adam or Cain or, or any of those people way back then? Well, because for one thing, it tells of all of creation. It tells of all the stories of people who have followed God and who haven't followed God. It tells the stories of people who were faithful to God and who were not faithful to God. It tells a lot of stories. It pertains to everybody. It, it tells us what to do and what not to do. It's a wonderful book. And as you'll see, it's full of power. The Word of God is quick. Quick. Wow. When I think of quick, I think fast. Man, Sister Cece got a new pair of sneakers yesterday, and she said these are the fastest shoes. You know how kids are. She loved them sneakers, and they were quick. But that's not what we're talking about here. What this is talking about, this is, uh, we have to remember that this is, um, 
this is um, the King James Version. So it was written in a language that we're not quite used to. It was written, written in an old English form. And what quicken means or quick means is alive. Quicken means made alive. The Word of God is quick. It's alive. The Word of God is alive. Can you imagine that? The Word of God is alive. Well, just think about it. The Word of God is alive. And it doesn't matter uh, if it's spoken, if we speak it, it's alive. Or if it's written and we're reading it, it's alive. It's a life-altering, a life-changing word is what it is. If it doesn't change your life, that's your bad. But I don't know of anybody who has actually sat down and studied a Bible and read a Bible. Many people have sat out to prove the Bible wrong. Atheists have sat down to prove the Bible wrong. And what did they do? They came out a believer. And more of a believer than most church-going people. It's life-altering. It changes your life. First Peter 1.23 says, Could you put that one up there, sister? Oh, you're quick. <laughs> Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And in the New Living Testament, it says, For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. It says right here that God's word is living. It's alive. It's living right along with us. It's, it's, it's what keeps us alive. Can you imagine if God set up everything on the earth and, 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 and he just totally left people alone? Can you imagine the chaos that there would be? Can you, you know what? I don't think it would have made it past uh, Adam and Eve. I really don't. It would have been a done deal if God would have just left everybody alone. But the word is so powerful that that's how God created was through his word. He said, let there be substance, and there was substance. He said, let there be light, and there was light in the darkness. He said, let there be people, and there was people. I mean, God spoke everything into existence. He spoke it all into existence. It's alive. God's word is alive. It does things. It works out things. And you know what the wonderful thing is? As we can ingest it, it'll work out things in our lives. It'll change our lives if we allow it to. But what happens a lot of times is we have so much of the world in us that it, it fights and it fights to... Actually, it doesn't fight. We fight. We fight against it. Because we are... Uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, <clears throat> conformed to the world that's the word I'm looking for but you know what if we allow it to the word will transform us Amen. and we need to allow that to happen we need to continue to allow that to happen but the problem is with a lot of us is we don't go home and get into our Bibles we wait until Sunday well I'll hear the Bible then you know I'll hear a couple of verses then well, you know what? If we're only ingesting a couple of, of verses a week, we're not getting very far. You know what? We should be hungry for the Word. Amen. Isn't your spiritual man hungry? Amen. But our bodies are weak. Our minds are weak. We, we, we say, oh, it'd be so much easier just to lay back. Yeah, I'll read it uh, tomorrow. We're bad about saying tomorrow. I'll, I'll read the Bible tonight. Yeah, I'm going to put aside a couple, couple hours a night. Yeah. Do you know what? Even if we put aside 10 minutes a night, 10 minutes a night, we'd be getting a daily dose. Just 10 minutes. 10 minutes of some serious study 
we would be seeing a lot of results. But no, we say, I'll put it off. I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, and guess what? I'll put it off. Tomorrow comes. You know what? Tomorrow never comes. Because you know what? When it's the next day, there's another tomorrow. So we just keep saying tomorrow, 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 and tomorrow never comes. That's right. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. For the word of God is quick and powerful. It's quick and powerful. So you might ask, how powerful is it? We can look at Isaiah 55, 11, which says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing to where I sent it. You know, there's a, um, I think go, something goes along with that verse, and it is compared to the rains that come down from heaven, and, 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 and it waters all the ground, and, and flows through the streams, and out into the river, and then finally out into the oceans, and it doesn't return to the sky again until it, it has fulfilled what it was put there to do, to do all the watering, and the and, and all the washing and whatever the purpose of the water was and it doesn't return to the sky again this is what God's word does too God's word has gone out and it comes down to us we can do what we want with it but somebody is going to prosper from it it says right there it shall not return to me void somebody is going to prosper from God's word why not make it ourselves you, 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 me, us, us is right here, as Sister Vi would say. Us, why don't we take the word and allow it to prosper in us? It's, it's not going to go back void. Somebody's going to prosper from it. We need to get greedy. Now, greediness is not a, 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 a very good thing maybe in God's eyes, but you know what? I think he can look it o over it when it's, about his word I think he'd be kind of proud of us when greediness would be in that way get greedy and say Lord I want it to prosper me your word is there to prosper everybody but especially for me you know he's especially putting his word out for you and you and you and you and me you know he died on the cross especially for you and for you, and especially for you, and especially for you, and especially for, for these two young men right here, and especially for me. He has also put his word out, especially for you, and especially for me. For each one of us, we're all special in his eyes. And we need to say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He could have left us here alone with nothing. But he gives us his written word. His written word. We're living in, 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 in the world that he spoke into existence. But we have allowed Satan to take over most of it. Let's start taking it back. How can we do that? By taking hold of God's word. Hmm. <clears throat> The Word of God is active, it's dynamic, and it's full of energy. It does things that no human being can possibly do. It touches where nothing else can touch, and it brings life. It is energizing, it is the power of God, and it's the most powerful tool in the universe. When God does the judging at the end of the time, what is, he, what is the standard he's going to judge by? By his Word. By his Word. We... That's why we all need to know his word. That is what God is going to judge us by, is by his word. We should all get to know his word. 
deeply and immensely and you know we should be swimming in his word we should 10 minutes a night I don't think that's too much to ask I think we should shoot for a little bit higher and maybe say well 30 minutes a night you know we got 24 hours in a, in a day that makes how many minutes um a thousand and some minutes how many minutes does that make who's good at math anyway so what's 30 minutes really let's put forth a little effort you know it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword sharper than any two-edged sword well, you know, a lot of things have been talked about, about a two-edged sword. And some people say, well, uh, uh, a, two, a double-edged sword it means one thing on one side and means something else. That's not what this is talking about at all. This is talking about a weapon that was very well known at the time that this was, was written. And if you think about it, you've seen it in a lot of movies, you know. You probably even see it in a lot of ninja movies, as a matter of fact. It's a sword that has an edge on each side. It's a very dangerous weapon. It's kept very, very sharp. And when it, it's made for doing all kinds of things, you can whack with this side, you can whack with this side, you can stab, and when you stab with it, it's sharp on both sides, so it penetrates very easily. It's a very dangerous weapon. That's what it is. And it was kept very, very, very sharp because that's how people made war and defended themselves they defended their own lives with it so you know that they wanted to keep it in tip-top shape all the time and they probably and warriors probably sat around all the time just sharpening this two-edged sword sharpening it sharpening it sharpening it cutting their little oh, oh that's sharp that made me bleed you know don't you think we just always used to check our pocket knives with lick our thumb and let just the weight of the knife go across it you know and if it dug into your to your thumbnail pretty good ah, i got it pretty sharp well you know what these that they're talking about probably take your thumb right off you know don't think you'd want to check it like that but god says you think that a two-edged sword is sharp well what about my word what about my word it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's more dangerous than a two-edged sword. It, it can accomplish more than a two-edged sword. It can get people's attention more than a two-edged sword. It can bring life and it can bring death. That's my two-edged sword. The Word of God is compared to other powerful things in the, in the Bible, too. In Ephesians 6.17, it's uh, called the sword of the spirit and in Jeremiah 23 29 it's comp compared to fire and a mighty hammer but in this verse it's compared to a two-edged sword why well I just I just told you it was kept very very sharp everybody knew what this was at this time and we still know what it is we still know what that double-edged sword is. So, you want to know how sharp God's word is? It's sharper than the sharpest sword that the world has ever known. That's how sharp it is. It cuts deep into us, way down deep where a surgeon's scalpel can't even get to. That's how deep it cuts into us. Piercing even to the dividing asunder. asunder. What does that mean? Piercing even to the dividing. It means into separate pieces. That's what that means. It means it cuts into separate pieces. <clears throat> of the soul and spirit. This is where it got really interesting to me. It cuts into different pieces of the soul and the spirit. So the soul and the spirit are tied so closely tied together that it's hard to tell them apart. I can't even really tell you without looking at stuff what the difference between the soul and the spirit is. Can, can y'all? I mean, I can't even really explain what a soul is compared to a spirit because they're so t closely tied together. 
Am I right? Can anybody here explain it? It's difficult to explain. But I can tell you that there's three parts of man. There's our body. This is the physical part of us. This is the part that we can really tell is here. This is the part that experiences pain. This is the part that, um, that has the five senses where we can smell, touch, taste, hurt, ouch, you know. The parts that, that we can really tell. That's our physical being. And then we have a soul. That's who we are. And that's the, our mind, which consists of our conscience and our will and our emotions and our personality. That makes us who we are. That makes us an individual. That makes us different than anybody else that God made. Does that make it a little easier to understand? Because it was very hard for me to understand. But I, I, I th by the looks of it, y'all are getting this. The soul is our personality. That's what makes us us. That's the individual part of us. That's the God, part that God made different in us than everybody else. And then there's our spirit. That's our life-giving force. And the function of the spirit, of course, is spiritual. It is contact and receive God himself. Now, of course, I'm sure that you can misuse this and probably contact some other spirits too, but I don't advise it. But that's how close things are. The soul and the spirit are so closely tied together. But what does this verse say? It says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. What does that mean? That means it can get right down in there. God's word is sharper than a sword that can, or even a surgeon's scalpel that can get in there and get in places. Can, can a surgeon get in there as sharp as his little scalpel is and as intricate as little cuts as he can make and all the stuff that they can do with, with, with uh, arteries and, and, and muscles and, and all these different things. The, all the miracles that they've done in medicine here lately, you know, the things they can remove cancer cells, they can, they can do all this, but can a surgeon get in there and divide your soul and your spirit? And he, where would he even start? Where would a surgeon even start? No, but you know what? God's word can do this. God's word can do this. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and the marrow. You know why it's talking about joints and the marrow? It's because how can someone get in there? Even the, the best surgeon you have ever seen, a brain surgeon, knew this. Ben Carson, who's done miraculous brain surgeries on people, especially children. And, and thank God for him because he's really done some mighty, wonderful things. And he's, he's done a lot of different things for, for free even out of the generosity of his heart. He's a, he's a good man. But he can't get in there and separate the marrow. Inside your bone, there's something called marrow. Anybody who's ever done any kind of butchering or anything probably knows that, or maybe you learned it in science class or whatever, but you have a marrow inside of the bone. But how can a surgeon get inside your bone and take out the marrow short of chopping your arm off? Short of, of chopping, in, in fact, chopping your bone in two. Because if you cut it off like a surgeon would, you know, a surgeon would probably take it off at a joint. And then you still can't get to the marrow. The only way that you can do that is to, and this is, this is so amazing. This is how good God's word is, is that this was written in the time of, I don't think they actually know for positive who wrote the book of Hebrews, but we think it was Brother Paul, I think. And 
So we're looking way back in Brother Paul time where we're thinking about, um, you know, people are pretty medieval back then, you know, they didn't know too much, they couldn't do too much, you know, they, they, they were primitive, you know, they, you know what, I think they might have been a little more civilized than what we give them credit for, because... If they know about the marrow in your bones and, and and that you can't get it out without, you know what? There might be a little might have been a little more civilized than what we give them credit for. But do you see the point that I'm trying to make? Is Paul is even telling us, or whoever the author is, is telling us you can't even get the marrow out of the bones. But God's word is so good it can get in, it can divide. Your, your spirit from your soul. We don't even know where to look for that stuff at. We barely know what it is. Maybe they weren't quite so primitive. Or maybe it's a good thing to be primitive and not to have so many crazy things on our minds like iPhones and TVs and, and radios and things that occupy our time other than God's Word. Am I right? So how do you get the, the marrow out of the bones? You just, you don't do it. You let God's word work on that part of your body. In other words, it seems impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Okay. And of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God exposes our innermost thoughts. It convicts us, it corrects us, it gets way down inside of us. It works in places that, that no psychologist can. Um, it works in places that even ourselves can't discover is way down deep inside of us. We might know that it's there, but we can't quite figure it out. It, we, we have problems way down inside of our mentality that we just, we really don't even know how they got there. And, and, and a lot of times they're just left alone to become a walking time bomb. The Word of God exposes our innermost thoughts. It exposes our innermost desires. It exposes our innermost secrets. It, it uh, exposes our innermost motives, our reasonings, and our intentions. You know... We can hide a lot of things from a lot of people. Things that we do, things that we think, ways that we feel. <laughs> we, can, we can hide hatred and animosity and we can hide all kinds of things from people, but we cannot hide it from God. But when God's word starts getting down into us, when we allow it to, when we aren't hurt too much or offended too much because somebody said something and brought it up because it was in the Bible and we're not offended too much and we decide to let that word start working in our lives, working on our lives, working on our problems, working on our innermost feelings, then what do we do? That's when we start to see change. That's when we start to see, rescue me, Jesus. That's when we start to see, thank you, Lord. God's word is powerful, but we, we have to allow it to work in our lives. It, it, it is so powerful. It's very active. It works in fascinating ways. But you have to get it in you, and you have to... You have to take time to put it in you you have to take time to think about it because if you don't think about it it can't work in you we have to meditate on it I mean I'm asking you to take 10 minutes out of your time and you know what read one verse it might take you a minute and meditate on it for nine you know what we have to let God's word work in us or how about this 
take two minutes to read a verse and think about it for 24 hours. Let it work on you. Let it go. God's word is powerful. It's alive. It wants to work in you. Sir? Comprehend it and absorb and apply it to your life. You can come to church all you want. But it, and you can even listen all you want. But when you walk out the door, if you just forget everything that you heard and you don't apply it to your lives and you don't ever think about it again, it's not doing you a bit of good. <laughs> oh, I forgot about one other part. So what is the heart? Because right here somewhere of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There's another part of us. Our heart. You know, the Bible talks about the heart some 600 times, but it is never ever meant as the organ that pumps the blood. Not even once is it mentioned as the organ that pumps blood. So, what, 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 do you, what does God consider a heart? It's your spirit and your soul together. Remember I told you that they were so closely tied together that you can't really... It's the spiritual, intellectual, moral, and emotional core of our lives. That's why when it says, serve God with all of your heart, love God with all of your heart, desire God with all of your heart, what does that mean? That means with everything you've got. That means with your whole... Use, use your soul in there too, you know? With everything you've got, all of your strength, your your emotions, your desires, your wants, your 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 own personality, take that and praise God with it. He's a discerner of our hearts. He's a discerner of our thoughts and the intents of our heart. You know, we can we can we can think a lot of things, you know, and, and sometimes we can you know who's the biggest deceiver? I, th I think we deceive ourselves more than Satan deceives us. You know what? Because a lot of times we know when Satan's trying to... But we talk ourselves into things. And we deceive ourselves. Because we're so conformed to this world, we, we talk ourselves into, well, everybody else does it. Or, well, it's right in the eyes of the police. Or, you know, it's right in the eyes of the law. Or, you know, it's so easy to talk yourself into certain things, you know? But if you have God's word in you, you can discern all that. God's word is a discerner of our thoughts. We can say that anything is right and come up with a reason for it. But does it go along with what God's word says? It's a discerner of our thoughts. Well, nobody... nobody has thoughts like I do. Well, maybe not in some places, but you mean to say that this Bible applies to everybody but you? Well, that's your own decision. That's your own decision. It is applied to everybody from the time of Adam up until now, and you're the only one that it doesn't apply to. So that's your decision. But it applies to everybody. It's the discerner of the thoughts. It, it, it tells us if we're thinking correctly or not. Now, we, it's called a conscience for one thing. You know, if you, when you get the truth in you, the revealed truth in you, and that's what this is. It's God's truth. It's God's truth. That's what his word is. When you have the truth in you, and you go to do something wrong, or you're thinking a wrong thought... You know, God's going to say, Hello, that's not right, and you know it's not. Now, you can ignore that and say, That's not for me. That doesn't apply to me. You know, I hate it. I work at a school. And there's there are signs. There's rules. It's like, don't park here. Don't park there. Don't pull up in the grass. And people think, I go to school here. It don't apply to me. I work here. It don't apply to me. You know, I can do this. It don't apply to me. I don't have to lock the gate. I work here. Oh, come on. 
Well, it's the same thing in our spiritual lives. All of this applies to us. <sighs> Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes with whom we have to do. There it is. But all things are naked and opened into, unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. Not only can we not hide from God, we can't hide anything from him. No secrets, no secret thoughts, no motives, no desires, no intentions. Nothing can be hidden. And we must all give to account to God. God's going to judge us by his word that he's given to us freely. He's given us his word freely. And he said, please partake. Please help yourselves. This, is, this word is creative. This word's going to help you. Y'all give you a good home. Y'all, you got to do is get this good word in you and apply it to your lives. It's not a hard thing to do. Go ahead. Come on, children. It's not a hard thing. If, if you don't like to read, I'll get give it to you on DVD or CD. If you like to watch a pretty picture with it, I'll give it to you on DVD. Just listen to it and apply it to your lives. It's all we got to do. It's all we got to do. Such a simple task. And apply it to our lives. And we're saying, I think I'd rather watch TV today. I'll, I'll think about going to heaven tomorrow. I'll think about going to live with God tomorrow. I think we should change our ways of thinking. I think we should say, I'm going to give the Lord 10 minutes tonight. And when that goes so well, I'm going to give him 20 minutes tomorrow. And when I start really learning things, I start getting excited. Woohoo! Lord, I'm growing. I'm going places. Father, I know I'm going to make it to heaven when I keep going like this. I'm giving you 30 minutes tomorrow. I'm going to give you half an hour out of 24 hours. Let's get generous now. People, I know that maybe I was getting a little sarcastic. But I am serious, though. You know, pick up your Bible and read it. There are special things waiting for you in that Bible. There's things that you can have revelations about that you can't have in the church. The Bible can teach you things that I could never even think about teaching you. Because you're an individual. You're an individual. You're an individual. We're all individuals. We're all just a little bit different. God gave us all the same word, but we all tick just a little bit differently. And what excites the, the dickens out of me might not make even a, might not even have nothing to do in your life or at least at this time we're all going through different places in our in our, in, in times of our life if you don't know where to start in the bible there's calendars you can read the bible and read just a little bit Probably, I don't know how much reading because I've never really done it. I'm sure somebody's done read the Bible in 365 days. What is it, five minutes of reading a day? It's not really the way that I like to study, but is it more than that, sister? Maybe 10 minutes a day? Yeah. Maybe a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, all I'm asking is that we understand what we're missing out on what are the wonderful things that we're missing out on when we don't pick up our bible and read it and apply it to our lives it's a wonderful thing it's a fantastic thing and you know what it makes for wonderful conversation when you come to the church too <laughs> can you come in and you say brother do it 
Did you know that I was reading the first Timothy yesterday? And do you know what it told me? I'm excited. But that's the least of it. Because when we actually apply it to our lives, we begin to grow. We begin to change. You know, well, I don't know. Some people might say, well, I don't want to change. I'm perfect just the way I am. I've heard some people say that. I'm, I'm, I'm already perfect. I, I don't need to get any better. That's not true. And we all know it's not. It's all change and grow. And But I encourage you, please just pick up your Bible and read it. You'll find a starting point. You know what? If you if you've never really read the Bible before, and you need a good starting point, you can start in John. If you're a little more advanced than that, start in Romans. Wonderful starting places, both of them. But I, I promise you, if you've read something before, grow a little bit and read it again, because you're going to get so much more out of it the second time than what you did the first time. So I'm going to quit rambling on right now. Please do me a favor. If anybody has decided right now to read their Bible a little bit more, just raise your hand up. You don't have to lift it very high. Just lift it just a little bit. You know? Okay. Praise the Lord.